Hi, I'm Karima Brown. It's Sunday and it's time for The Fix. First up, the Zonda Commission of Inquiry into State Capture has resumed for 2020. We take a look at what its prospects are to get to the bottom of state capture. Then we look at the emotive issue of land reform as the clock ticks on legislation that could well be a game changer. And as is custom, we take a look at what's made newspaper headlines in the weekend papers and why. The Fix starts now. Welcome to this edition of The Fix, where every Sunday we hold the decision makers to account. We tell you why it matters, how it affects you, and why you should care. Now, on Tuesday, the Zondo Commission of Inquiry into State Capture resumed its work. To look at what lies ahead, I'm joined by David Lewis. He's the executive director of Corruption Watch, as well as Lawson Naidu, who is from the Council for the Advancement of the South African Constitution. Gentlemen, welcome to The Fix. Thank you so much for joining us. David Lewis, let me start with you. We saw uh, the commission um, investigators arguing uh, for former President Jacob Zuma to actually be compelled to testify. We saw the former president's lawyers uh, push back as they usually do. And we might even see a um, application to, on the part of Zuma to have the commission declared null and void, a commission that he established. What are his chances of getting that right? Or is this just a, another stalling tactic on his uh, part? Well, it's clearly, what, you know, whatever it is, whether he gets it right or whether he doesn't get it right, it's a stalling tactic. Um, you know, right from the beginning, there have been uh, questions raised regarding the uh, lawfulness of the commission uh, because of the way in which it was established. I mean, yes. if you remember, as Zuma was effectively instructed by the public protector yes. and told who to appoint to appoint the commissioner. And uh, and so, you know, there's lawyers, some lawyers think it's vulnerable. But, I mean, to try and sort of interdict effectively the commission, you know, a year and a half or something into its work, mm. I mean, I think it shows huge bad faith. And I can't really, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, but I can't imagine the courts mm. looking too fondly upon such a blatant act of obstruction actually if he'd done it at the beginning of the process there may have been a serious legal argument to have i don't think there is one anymore lawson do you concur with um david indeed i do uh, karima and i think you know it's important to note that uh, yes it was the recommendation from the public protector but it was a, re a, a part of a remedial action that was confirmed by the high court in Pretoria, when uh, then President Zuma took, uh, ch challenged the uh, aspects of the report in the High Court, he lost that case, and that is what ultimately led to the establishment of this commission. And I agree that you know two years down the line is a bit late to be uh, questioning the uh, uh, the basis for the establishment of the commission. Now, David, one of the things that could potentially uh, be um, an important issue is the lifespan of the Commission. As we know, it has a very specific uh, time frame. We know that a lot of work still needs to be done. Do you expect that uh, the Deputy Chief Justice will request that extension? Um, and more importantly, will the President grant it? I had understood, and you know, you probably know this better than me, that they had actually already asked for an extension. But well, they certainly made it quite clear they were going to be asking for an extension. Yes, I think that the extension will be granted. I mean, this is a huge task, and you know, I don't know what the extension is required for. Is it to draft the report? Mm. Is it to take more witnesses? Um, so I think the extension will be granted, and I think it would be churlish not to grant it after having you know, invested this much money, time, energy in the mm. report if they need a, another couple of months to complete it. And I think, you know, the Zondo Commission, and we've said right from the beginning of this thing, has missed a real opportunity in not producing interim reports. Mm. It should have done so. 
but you know if that's what it for whatever reason it chose not to do so and it now needs another two three months to finish the thing then they should be allowed to finish it in fact it segues into the question i wanted to ask you lawson we saw the nugent commission of inquiry do precisely what david said it produced an interim report we saw the president act on it it resulted in tom moyani being axed um do you think it's a weakness on the part of the zondo commission or do you think the Ch deputy chief justice is playing it safe given how loaded this is and of course the fact that it involves uh, an entire executive um, of a previous administration in many ways and uh, that the stakes are just too high. Uh, well Karima I, I mean I, I, I agree with David I think it's quite clear that the, the way that the work of the Commission has been structured has not uh, produced maximum efficiency in the work of the Commission. I think if the uh, Deputy Chief Justice had uh, I, you know, uh, I clearly identified the different aspects of the terms of reference and dealt, dealt, dealt with them sequentially rather than trying to deal with all of them at the same time. You know, we've now uh, heard 154 witnesses at the Zondo Commission, and uh, and yet we we don't have a clear indication of when he, whether any particular aspects of the uh, terms of reference have been properly disposed of fully as yet. And in the context of the, your question about the extension, uh, uh, the Deputy Chief Justice has in fact applied for an extension. An application was lodged with a uh, High Court in, uh, in December last month. And he's seeking an extension until the end of this year, until uh, December 2020. Uh, our concern with that is, uh, whilst I agree that the extension ought to be granted, I think there needs to be much greater clarity as to how this additional time is going to be used. It's not simply a question of using the time to write up the report, uh, but also to hear further testimony. And I think the Deputy Chief Justice needs to spell out very clearly exactly how this additional time is going to be used so that we reach an end point uh, at the end of 2020 and we can then move on. David, there's a lot of talk, um, and it's just talk, um, that the Commission isn't actually going to get us to the truth um, and isn't actually going to recommend uh, far-reaching um, you know, uh, decisions. You've made the point before that commissions of inquiry are as good as their terms of reference um, and that it doesn't necessarily give you the truth always. Um, the way in which the Chief, Deputy Chief Justice has managed this process, do you think we are going to be able to get to the um, objectives set out by the Commission? And more importantly, will we get to justice? You know, I don't think it's a, a question of the way in which he's handled it. I mean, you, there are some criticisms, and it. I think it's a very complex uh, uh, com commission to, to manage. I mean, the question to me is that the public are expecting and I can understand why I mean the 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 testimony that turned everybody on was the agreesies the like yes. naming names pointing fingers showing where the safe was I I would rather hope that what the Commission comes out is not a finding on whether you know agreesy is guilty or Bosasa mm. is guilty or whatever but on identifying the underlying systemic factors mm. that made us so vulnerable to corruption yes. and using the information that they've had as i say that they the, the, the considerable testimony that they've that they've heard not to find guilt on the part of one party or another party but to find out what happened mm. and to make recommendations you know there may be recommendations from anything from the you know whistleblowing act to the Prevention of Combating of Corruption Act to God knows the Companies Act aimed at closing the loopholes and reducing the vulnerability. Mm -hmm. And the vulnerability lay in bad people, there's yes. no doubt about it. Uh, bad people, but bad people exploited opportunities mm -hmm. and we must find out how to close those opportunities, shut down those opportunities. So I, I think it's still, I'm, I, I'm still hopeful that the Zondo, very hopeful that the Zondo Commission is going to produce an interesting outcome mm -hmm. but they have gone about it in a rather sort of ponderous kind of way and the contrast is with judge nugent's uh, uh, commission which was very uh, aggressive and mm -hmm. to the point 
Um, but it did have an easier remit. It had a much yes. more focused remit than the Zondo Commission. Lawson, are you satisfied that the Commission has the forensic capacity to get to what um, David is talking about, those loopholes that exist in the system over and above uh, where the bad people take bad decisions and exploit the system? Will the forensic investigators be able to get to how it was possible to create an alternative state within a state, how it was able to hollow out institutions and what we need to do to close that gap? Well, I think uh, the answer to that, Karima, will come uh, when the report is published and, uh, and then, uh, then and then only, I think, will we see to what extent uh, the Commission and its uh, investigating team has been, have been able to get to the bottom of uh, how this uh, phenomenon of state capture came to take uh, root in, in the country, how institutions were, were corrupted, what weaknesses there are in our, uh, in our institutional governance framework that allowed this to happen. So those, I think, I think, I think uh, are the, are the uh, questions that we want the Zondo Commission to address in its final report to show us uh, how, what steps we need to take to prevent this from ever ha happening again. Alongside that, there's obviously the, the issue of uh, the culpability of, of uh, particular individuals and, and, and uh, uh, companies involved in state capture. And those are matters that I think that ultimately will uh, rely on the criminal justice system, on the Hawks uh, and the NPA in particular, to take further steps to ensure that there are prosecutions for people who are, have been identified through the workings of the Commission as having been complicit in enabling and benefiting from state capture. David, the uh, point that Lawson is making is that there's obviously the Zondo Commission, but there's an array of other uh, ways in which you can also combat corruption. You have gone to court on some matters. You've laid charges against individuals. In that value chain of uh, institutional capacity to tackle corruption, what else needs to be sped up? Um, for example, we heard some people were uh, going to be arrested. Some were, in fact, arrested at ESCOM. But just this morning, for example, we saw that one of the engineers who work at ESCOM, the stories in the city press, um, had cooked a tender and uh, given it to a family member, and it's apparently part of the reason why we've had the blackouts, because, uh, you know, the, uh, the services were substandard. So a lot of those people are actually still in place. The Zonda Commission is not going to get to them. Ought the Hawks to be getting to them? Yes. I mean, there's no question about it. And, and, and the, the criminal justice process and investigations and prosecutions doesn't have to wait for the Zondo Commission. Quite the contrary. Um, uh, you know, what you're looking at are, are and, uh, you know, I have to say that General Labia and, and uh, particularly uh, Advocate Patoy have been, you know, candid in outlining this. What you look at are two decimated institutions. Mm. Um, that I think are in the process of being rebuilt by some seriously energetic and committed leadership, but uh, they, they have to be rebuilt. You know, it's not like, you know, all these things you hear in the public domain, many of them have not been investigated by the police before, by the Hawks before, mm. and they've got to do the investigation. They can't simply take what is said at the Zondo Commission. So that will take a while. And then criminal justice proceedings, as we all know, take... Uh, take a long time. I mean, I, I'm rather hoping that when they start to arrest people, and they are starting already, people at the sort of ESCOM engineer level, but yes. obviously most significantly people at the highest, highest yes. level, I think as soon as others start to mm. see that the risks of this may be too high, you're going to find people starting to volunteer to yes. give information in sort of plea bargaining type deals. And I think the momentum... Uh, this is an optimistic view, but I mm. think the momentum could speed up considerably once the canaries start singing. So, Lawson, do you concur with Dave uh, on the fact that if a very high-profile person is actually charged, cuffed, and has to face a uh, formidable court case put together by the NPA, that other people will then start thinking of their own interest and saying, listen, I don't want to go to jail, but I can offer this testimony uh, in return for you being able to get to, uh, you know, the guys at the top. Hmm. Uh, I certainly think so, and I certainly hope so. <coughs> I think it was very much this culture of impunity that uh, took root 
uh, uh, as a result of the decimation of the Hawks and the NPA and the SAPs more broadly, uh, that allowed people to become so brazen in their, uh, in their looting spree. And I think uh, once we begin to extract accountability from one or two very high-profile people, I think others will then begin to, to see that the narrative is going to be closing in on them, and they will certainly be looking at, at avenues to minimize their culpability, seeking to, uh, to provide uh, evidence to the state and entering into plea bargain arrangements and the like. So I think that's something that's likely to happen. But uh, as we know, and I, uh, you know, uh, agree with what David said about you know rebuilding institutions like the Hawks and the NPA, but whilst they're in the process of rebuilding, they also have to deliver on their mandates and ensure that people who have uh, committed wrongdoing are actually brought before the courts. David, I want to end off our conversation with taking us a little bit back in time because we're talking about capacity of institutions mm. to bring about justice. Um, a contemporary of yours uh, who was killed, uh, Dr. Neil Agate, the inquest into his death starts tomorrow uh, and it is set down for a period of five weeks. It's being heard here in Gauteng, uh, Johannesburg High Court. Um, look at how long it has taken. We still don't have clarity on who killed Neil Agate. Mm. Uh, who was, of course, a trade unionist with you in your other life. Um, how important is this inquest? And how important is it for people who seek answers to never give up um, pursuing the ends of justice and that justice eventually be served? I, I think it's very important. I mean, you know, we've just had the Timmel inquest done actually by the same team of lawyers who are doing the Agate representing Timmel, representing Agate, fantastic lawyers. Um, I think it's very important. I, you know, it's it's clearly very important for the families. Yes. But there are also, you know, episodes in South African history yes. that we need to get some sort of closure on. You know, the Truth Commission brought us something of that. But I think these mm. detailed forensic examinations, I mean, people, you know, need to know what happened in the past in order not to repeat it in the future. And unfortunately, police repression is not necessarily only... Uh, uh, um, uh, an apartheid state phenomenon it can and it does happen anywhere yes and you need to know about how it happens and what are the limits to what police the police can do and I think these um, these inquests are, are very important absolutely actually. in 30 seconds just for people who are wondering who Neil Agate was uh, you worked with him yeah. why is he such an important figure and why was he killed I mean we still don't know well, I mean, you know, Neil, the Neil I knew was a trade unionist in the Western Cape. I was a unionist in the West, based in the Western Cape as well. We worked together. We worked together a lot. He was, like all of us, a very politicized person. He, he may or may not have had links with the sort of underground. That's not something one tended to discuss overground. Yes. Um, I, 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 I don't know, but I know that he was very, very severely tortured, I presume because they suspected he had, or maybe they just didn't like him. I mean, mm. there was, you know, no way of, of knowing why they did what they did. And, um, and you know, certainly we, we believed murdered and that, you know, you know, I don't know who delivered the final blow, but, I mean, certainly what they did to Neil um, would have, any of us would have, contemplated death as a better option but so it's I've been sometimes said that the people thought that he committed suicide well you know this is certainly well, finally we will get an opportunity suicide. to hear yeah. what exactly the cause of death was and of course in the Timor case it's now led to criminal prosecutions yeah, yeah, so thank you so very much uh, Dave Lewis and of course Lawson Naidu uh, discussing there the prospects of the Zonda Commission but also corruption in general and throwing forward of course to the inquest into Dr. Neil Neil Agate's death so many years ago. Still ahead, we discuss the land question. Stay tuned.